Chapter Eleven of The Temptation of Saint Anthony by Gustav Flaubert, translated by Lacadio Herm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Nothing is now visible. The darkness is complete. Only that from the eyes of Hilarion escape two flashes, two rays of lurid light. Antony begins at last to notice his immense stature. Already several times while thou wert speaking, it seemed to me thou wert growing taller, and it was no illusion. How? Explain to me. Thy aspect terrifies me. Footsteps are heard approaching. What is that? Hilarium, extending his arm. Look! Then, under a pale beam of moonlight, Antony distinguishes an interminable caravan defiling over the summit of the rocks, and each voyager, one after the other, falls from the cliff into the gulf below. First comes the three great gods of Samothrace, Axiaros, Axiokeros, Axiokersa, united together as in a fascia, purple masked, all with hands uplifted. Aesculapius advances with a melancholy air, not even perceiving Samos and Telesphoros, who question him, with gestures of anguish. Iliam, Sozipolis, of python form, rolls his coils toward the abyss. Dozipoina becomes dizzy, leaps in of her own accord. Britomatis, shrieking with fear, clutches fast the meshes of her net. The centaurs come at a wild gallop and roll pell-mell into the black gulf. Behind them, all limping, advance the bands of the morning nymphs. Those of the meadows are covered with dust. Those of the woods moan and bleed, wounded by the axes of the woodcutters. The jaludes, the strigii, the empusai, all the infernal goddesses form one pyramid of blended fangs, vipers, and torches, and, seated upon a vulture-skin at its summit, Eurynome, blue as the flies that corrupt meat, devours her own arms. Then, in one great whirl, simultaneously disappear the bloody Orthia, Hymena of Orchomenus, the Lapria of the Patreans, Aphia of Agina, Bendis of Thrace, Stymphalia with thighs like a bird's. Triopos, in lieu of three eyes, has now but three empty orbits. Erictonius, his legs paralyzed, crawls upon his hands like a cripple. Hilarium, what a pleasure is it not to see them all in the abjection of their death agony climb up here beside me on this rock and thou shalt be even as xerxes reviewing his army beyond there very far dost thou behold that fair bearded giant who even now lets fall his sword crimsoned with blood uh, that is the scythian zalmoxus between two planets Artimpasa, Venus, and Orsiloke, the moon. Still further away, now emerging from pallid clouds, are the gods whom the Cimmerians adore, even beyond Thule. Their huge halls were warm, and by the gleam of swords that tapestried the vault, they drank their hydromel from horns of ivory. They ate the liver of the whale in dishes of brass wrought by the hammers of demons, or betimes 
they listened to captive sorcerers whose fingers played upon harps of stone they are feeble they are cold the snow makes heavy their bearskins and their feet show through the rents in their sandals they weep for the vast fields upon whose grassy knolls they were wont to draw breath in pauses of battle they weep for the long ships whose prowess forced away through the mountains of ice and the skates wherewith they followed the orb of the poles upbearing at the length of their mighty arms all the firmament that turned with them a gust of frosty wind carries them off antony turns his eyes another way and he perceives outlined in black against a red background certain strange personages with chin bands and gauntlets who throw balls at one another leap over each other's heads make grimaces dance a frenzied dance hilarion those are the divinities of etruria the innumerable azars there is a tages by whom augury was invented with one hand he seeks to augment the divisions of the sky with the other he supports himself upon the earth let him sink therein northia gazes at the wall into which she drave nails to mark the number of the passing years its whole surface is now covered and the period is accomplished like two travellers overtaken by a storm castor and pulatuk trembling seek to shelter themselves beneath the same mantle antony closes his eyes enough enough but with a mighty noise of wings all the victories of the capital pass through the air hiding their faces with their hands dropping the trophies hanging upon their arms janus lord of crepuscules flees upon a black ram and one of his two faces is already putrefied the other slumbers with fatigue sormanus the headless god of the dark heavens presses against his heart an odd cake shaped like a wheel vesta beneath a ruined cupola tries to relight her extinguished lamp bologna gashes her cheeks without being able to make that blood flow by which her devotees were purified antony mercy they weary me hilarium before they amused thee and he shows him in a grove of bean trees a woman naked and a black man holding in each hand a torch it is the goddess of aresia with the demon verbius her sacerdote the king of the grove had to be an assassin and the fugitive slaves the despoilers of corpses the brigands of the via solari the cripples of the pon sublicius all the human vermin of the sabura worship no deities so fervently in the time of marcus antonius the patrician women preferred libertina and he shows him under the shadow of cypresses and rose trees another woman clad in gauze around her lie spades litters black hangings all the paraphernalia of funerals she smiles her diamonds shine afar off through spiders webs the larvae like skeletons show their bones through the branches and the lemures who are phantoms extend their butt-like wings at the end of a field lies the god terminus uprooted and covered with ordures in the centre of a furrow the great corpse of vertumnus is being devoured by red dogs the rustic deities all depart weeping 
Sartor, Sarator, Vervactor, Colina, Valona, Hostilinus, all wearing little hooded mantles and carrying either a hoe, a pitchfork, a hurdle, or a boar spear. Hilarion. Their spirits made prosperous the villa with its dovecots, its parks of dormice its poultry yards protected by nets its warm stables fragrant with odours of cedar also they protected all the wretched population who dragged the irons upon their legs over the flinty ways of the sabine country those who called the swine together by sound of horn those who were wont to gather the bunches at the very summits of the elms those who drove the asses laden with manure over the winding bypaths the panting labourer leaning over the handle of his plough prayed them to give strength to his arms and under the shade of the lindens beside calabashes filled with milk the cowherds were wont in turn to sound their praises upon flutes of reed antony sighs and in the centre of a chamber upon a lofty estrade an ivory bed is visible surrounded by persons bearing torches of pine those are the deities of marriage they await the coming of the bride domiduca should lead her in virgo unfasten her girdle sabigo place her in the bed and praima open her arms and whisper sweet words into her ear but you will not come and they dismiss the others nona and decima who watch by sick beds the three nixii who preside over childbirth the two nurses educa and botana and kana guardian of the cradle whose bouquet of hawthorn keeps evil dreams from the child afterwards Osipago should strengthen his knees, Barbatus give him his first beard, Stimula inspire his first desires, Volupia grant him his first enjoyment, Fabulimus should have taught him to speak, Numera to count, Camoina to sing, Consus to reflect. This chamber is empty, and there remains only the centenarium nynia beside the bed muttering to herself the dirge she was wont to howl at the funerals of aged men but her voice is soon drowned by sharp cries these are uttered by valares domestici crouching at the further end of the atrium clad in dogskins with flowers wreathed about their bodies pressing their clenched hands against their cheeks and weeping as loudly as they can where is the portion of food we received at each repast the kindly care of the maid-servant the smile of the matron the merriment of the little boys playing at knuckle-bones on the mosaic pavement of the courtyard when grown up they used to hang about our necks their boule of gold or leather what happiness it was when on the evening of a triumph the master entering turned his humid eyes upon us he would recount his combats and the little house would be prouder than a palace sacred as a temple how sweet were the family repasts above all on the morrow of the feralia tenderness for the dead appeased all discords all kissed each other while drinking to the glories of the past and the hopes of the future but the ancestors of painted wax locked up behind us are slowly becoming covered with mould the new races visiting their own deceptions upon us have shattered our jaws our wooden bodies are disappearing piecemeal under the teeth of rats and the innumerable gods watching over doors kitchens cellars baths disperse in every direction 
under the form of enormous ants running over the pavement, or great butterflies soaring away. Then a roll of thunder is heard. A voice. I was the god of armies, the lord, the lord god. I pitched the tents of Jacob on the hills, and in the midst of the sand I nourished my chosen people in their flight. It was I who consumed the city of Sodom with fire. It was I who overwhelmed the world with the waters of the deluge. It was I that drowned Pharaoh with all the princes, sons of kings, making the sea to swallow up his chariots of war and his charioteers. I, the jealous god, held all other gods in abomination. I braved the impure in my anger, the mighty I cast down, and swiftly the desolation of my wrath ran to the right and to the left like a dromedary loosened in a field of maize. I chose the humble to deliver Israel. Angels, flame-winged, spake to them from out the bushes. Perfumed with spikenard, with cinnamon and myrrh, clad in transparent robes, and shod with high-heeled sandals, women of valiant heart went forth to slay captains. The passing wind carried my prophets with it. My law I graved upon tables of stone. Within that law my people were enclosed as within a strong citadel. They were my people. I was their god. The land was mine. The men also belonged to me, together with their every thought and all their works and the tools they wrought with and their prosperity. My ark reposed within a triple sanctuary, surrounded by curtains of purple and lighted candelabra. I had a whole tribe to serve me as servants, swinging censers, and the high priest, robed in robes of hyacinth, wore upon his breast precious stones disposed in symmetrical order. Woe! Woe! The Holy of Holies is open, the veil is rent, the perfumes of the holocaust are dissipated by all the winds of heaven, the jackal winds in the sepulchres, my temple is destroyed, my people dispersed, the priests have been strangled with the girdles of their robes, the women languish in captivity, the holy vessels have all been melted, the voice becoming more distant i was the god of armies the lord the lord god an enormous silence follows and deepest night antony all have passed away some one replies i remain and Hilarion stands before him, but transfigured, holy, beautiful as an archangel, luminous as a sun, and so lofty that in order to behold his face, Antony is compelled to throw back his head, to look up as though gazing at a star. Who art thou? Hilarion, my kingdom is vast as the universe, and my desire knows no limits. I go on for ever, freeing minds, weighing worlds, without hatred, without fear, without pity, without love, and without God. Men call me science. Antony, recoiling from him, say rather that thou art the devil. Hilarion, fixing his eyes upon him, wouldst thou behold him? Antony cannot detach his eyes from that mighty gaze. The curiosity of the devil comes upon him. His terror augments, 
yet his wish grows even to boundlessness yet if i should see him if i were to see him then in a sudden spasm of wrath the horror that i have of him will free me from his presence for ever yes a cloven foot appears antony regrets his wish but the devil flings him upon his horns and bears him away End of chapter 11chapter twelve of the temptation of st anthony by gustav flaubert translated by lafcadio hearn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony addison six he flies beneath him outstretched like a swimmer his vast spreading wings wholly concealing him seem like one huge cloud antony whither do i go but a little while ago i beheld in a glimpse the form of the accursed nay tis a cloud that upbears me perhaps i am dead and am ascending to god how freely i respire the immaculate air seems to vivify my soul no sense of weight no more suffering far below me the lightning breaks the horizon broadens widens the rivers cross each other that blond bright spot is the desert that pool of water the ocean and other oceans appear oh vast regions of which i knew nothing there are the countries of the blacks which seem to smoke like braziers then is the zone of snows always made dim by fog would i might behold those mountains where the sun each evening sinks to rest the devil the sun never sinks to rest the sun never rests antony is not surprised at this voice it seems to him an echo of his own thought a response made by his own memory meanwhile the earth gradually assumes the shape of a ball and he beholds it in the midst of the azure turning upon its poles and revolving with the sun the devil so it does not form the centre of the universe pride of man humiliate thyself antony now i can scarcely distinguish it it mingles confusedly with other glowing worlds the firmament itself is but one tissue of stars and they still rise no sound not even the hoarse cry of eagles nothing i listen for the harmony of the spheres the devil thou wilt not hear them nor wilt thou behold the antictonus of plato or the central furnace of philolaus or the spheres of aristotle or the seven heavens of the jews with the great waters above the vault of crystal antony yet from below the vault seemed solid as a wall on the contrary i penetrate it i lose myself in it and he beholds the moon like a rounded fragment of ice filled with motionless light the devil formerly it was the sojourn of souls even the good pythagoras adorned it with magnificent flowers populated it with birds antony i can see only desolate plains there with extinct craters yawning under a black sky oh let us go towards those milder beaming stars that we may contemplate the angels who uphold them at arm's length like torches the devil bears him into the midst of the stars they attract at the same time that they repel each other the action of each one 
results from that of others and contributes thereunto without the aid of any auxiliary by the force of a law the virtue of order alone antony yes yes my intelligence grasps the great truth it is a joy greater than all tender pleasures breathless i find myself with astonishment at the enormity of god the devil even as the firmament ever rises as thou dost ascend so with the expansion of thy thought will he become greater to thee and after this discovery of the universe thou wilt feel thy joy augment with the broadening and deepening of the infinite antony ah higher higher still for ever higher then the stars multiply scintillate the milky way develops in the zenith like a monstrous belt with holes at intervals through these rents in its brightness stretches of prolonged darkness are visible there are rains of stars long trains of golden dust luminous vapours that float and dissolve at times a comet suddenly passes by then the tranquillity of innumerable lights recommences antony with outstretched arms supports himself upon the devil's horns and thus occupies all the space between them he remembers with disdain the ignorance of other days the mediocrity of his dreams and now those luminous globes he was wont to gaze upon from below are close to him he distinguishes the intercrossing of the lines of their orbits the complexity of their courses he beholds them coming from afar and like stone suspended in a sling describe their circles form their hyperbolas he perceives all within the field of his vision at once the southern cross and the great bear the lynx and the centaur the nebula of dorado the six suns in the constellation of orion jupiter with his four satellites and the triple ring of the monstrous saturn all the planets all the stars that men will discover in the future he fills his eyes with their light he overburdens his mind with calculation of their distances then bowing his head he murmurs what is the purpose of all that the devil there is no purpose how could god have a purpose what experience could have instructed him what reflection determined him before the beginning he could not have acted and now his action would be useless antony yet he created the world at one time by his word alone the devil but the beings that people the earth come upon it successively so also in heaven new stars arise different effects of varying causes antony the varying of causes is the will of god the devil but to admit several acts of will in god is to admit various causes and therefore to deny his unity his will is inseparable from his essence he can have but one will having but one essence and inasmuch as he externally exists he acts eternally contemplate the sun from its surface leap vast jets of flame casting forth sparks that disperse beyond to become worlds hereafter and further than the last far beyond those deeps where thou seest only night will other suns and behind them others again and beyond those yet others without end antony enough enough i fear i will fall into the abyss the devil pauses and rocks antony gently in the midst of space nothingness is not there is no void 
everywhere and for ever bodies move upon the immovable deeps of space were there boundaries to space it would not be space but a body only it is limitless antony stupefied by wonder limitless the devil ascend skyward for ever and for ever yet thou wilt not attain the summit descend below the earth for billions of billions of centuries never wilt thou reach the bottom for there is no summit there is no bottom there is no above no below nor height nor depth as signified by the terms of human utterance and space itself is comprised in god who is not a portion thereof of such or such a size but is immensity itself antony slowly matter then must be a part of god the devil why not canst thou know the end of god antony nay on the contrary i prostrate i crush myself beneath his mightiness the devil and yet thou dost pretend to move him thou dost speak to him thou dost even adorn him with virtues with goodness justice mercy in lieu of recognizing that all perfections are his to conceive aught beyond him is to conceive god above god the being above the being for he is the only being the only substance if the substance could be divided it would not be the substance it would lose its nature god could not exist he is therefore indivisible as infinite and if he had a body he would be composed of parts he would not be one he would not be infinite therefore he is not a person antony what my prayers my sobs my groans the sufferings of my flesh the transports of my love have all these things gone out to a lie to emptiness unavailingly like the cry of a bird like a whirl of dead leaves weeping oh no there is some one above all things a great soul a lord a father whom my heart adores and who must love me the devil thou dost desire that god were not god for did he feel love or anger or pity he would abandon his perfection for a greater or a lesser perfection he can stoop to no sentiment nor be contained in any form antony one day nevertheless i shall see him the devil with the blessed is it not when the finite shall enjoy the infinite in some restricted place containing the absolute antony matters not there must be a paradise for the good as there is a hell for the wicked the devil can the desire of thy mind create the law of the universe without doubt evil is indifferent to god for as much as the earth is covered with it is it through impotence that he endures it or through cruelty that he maintains it dost thou fancy that he is eternally readjusting the world like an imperfect machine that he is for ever watching the movements of all beings from the flight of a butterfly to the thought of a man if he have created the universe his providence is superfluous if providence exists then creation is defective but evil and good concern only thee even like night and day pleasure and pain death and birth which are relative only to one corner of space to a special centre to a particular interest since the infinite is permanent the infinite is and that is all the devil's wings have been gradually expanding now they cover all space antony now perceives nothing a great faintness comes upon him a hideous cold freezes me 
even to the depths of my soul this is beyond the extreme of pain it is like a death that is deeper than death i roll in the immensity of darkness and the darkness itself enters within me my consciousness bursts beneath this dilation of nothingness the devil yet the knowledge of things comes to thee only through the medium of thy mind even as a concave mirror it deforms the objects it reflects and thou hast no means whatever of verifying their exactitude never canst thou know the universe in all its vastness consequently it will never be possible for thee to obtain an idea of its cause to have a just notion of god nor even to say that the universe is infinite for thou must first be able to know what the infinite is may not form be perhaps an error of thy senses substance a figment of thy imagination unless indeed that the world being a perpetual flux of things appearance on the contrary be wholly true illusion the only reality but art thou sure thou dost see art thou even sure thou dost live perhaps nothing exists the devil has seized antony and holding him at arm's length glares at him with mouth yawning as though to devour him adore me then and curse the phantom thou callest god antony lifts his eyes with a last effort of hope the devil abandons him end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of The Temptation of Saint Anthony by Gustav Flaubert, translated by Lafcadio Hearn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Seven. Anthony finds himself lying upon his back at the verge of the cliff the sky commences to blanch is it the glow of dawn or only an effect of moonlight antony finds himself lying upon his back at the verge of the cliff the sky commences to blanch is it the glow of dawn or only an effect of moonlight he tries to rise falls back his teeth chattering i feel such a helplessness of weakness as though all my bones were broken why ah the devil i remember he even repeated to me all that i learned from the age of didymus respecting the opinions of Xenophanes, Heraclitus, of Melissus, of Anaxagoras, concerning the infinite, the creation, the impossibility of knowing anything. And yet, I believe that I could unite myself to God. Laughing bitterly. <laughs> madness! Madness! Is the fault mine? Prayer has become intolerable to me my heart is dry as a rock once it was wont to overflow with love the sand used to smoke of mornings like the odorous dust of a censer at sunset flowers of fire used to bloom upon the cross and in the middle of the night it often seemed as though all beings and all things lying under the same awful silence were adoring the Lord with me. Oh, charms of prayer, felicities of ecstasy, gifts of heaven, what have become of you? I remember a voyage I made with Ammon in search of a solitary place suited for the establishment of a monastery. It was the last evening. We hastened our steps, walked side by side 
murmuring hymns without conversing as the sun sank the shadows of our bodies lengthened like two obelisks continually growing taller and moving before us here and there we planted crosses made with fragments of our sticks to mark the site of a future cell night was tardy in her coming and waves of darkness overspread the earth even while a vast rose-coloured light still glowed in heaven when i was a child i used to amuse myself by building hermitages with pebbles my mother sitting beside me would watch me so attentively will she not have cursed me for having abandoned her will she not have plucked out her white hair by handfuls in the despair of her grief and her corpse remains lying on the floor of the hut under the roof of reeds between the crumbling walls through an orifice a hyena snuffing thrusts his head advances his mouth oh horror horror sobbing no Amonaria will not have abandoned her where is she now Amonaria? perhaps at the further end of a bathroom she removes her garments one after the other first the mantle then the girdle then the first tunic the second lighter tunic all her necklaces and the vapour of cinnamon envelops her naked limbs at last she lies down upon the tepid mosaic her long hair spreading below the curve of her hip seems like a sable fleece and the oppressiveness of the heated air causes her to pant her waist arch her breast standing out what my flesh repels again even in the midst of grief am i tortured by concupiscence to be subjected thus unto two tortures at once is beyond endurance i can no longer bear myself he leans over and gazes into the abyss the man who should fall would be killed nothing easier it were only necessary to roll over upon my left side only one movement one then suddenly appears an aged woman antony starts to his feet in a fright it seems to him that he beholds his mother arisen but this woman is far older and prodigiously thin a shroud knotted about her head hangs down together with her white hair so as to cover her legs slender as crutches the brilliancy of her ivory-coloured teeth make her earthy skin darker still the orbits of her eyes are full of shadow and far back within them two flames vacillate like the lamps of sepulchres she exclaims advance what hinders thee antony stammering i f f fear to commit it a sin she replies but king saul killed himself razias a just man killed himself saint pelagia of antioch killed herself domina of aleppo and her two daughters all three saints killed themselves and remember also how many confessors delivered themselves up to the executioner in their impatient longing for death that they might enjoy death more speedily the virgins of miletus strangled themselves with their girdles at syracuse the philosopher hegesias preached so eloquently upon death that men deserted the lupanas to go hang themselves in the fields the patricians of Borm sought for death 
as a new form of debord antony ay the love of death is strong and many an anchorite has succumbed to it the old woman to do that which will make thee equal unto god thing he created thee thou wilt destroy his work thou and by thy courage of thy own free will the enjoyment that erostratus knew was not greater than this and moreover thy body has so long mocked thy soul that it is full time thou shouldst take vengeance upon it thou wilt not suffer it will soon be over of what art thou afraid a wide black hole perhaps it is a void antony hearkens without replying and upon the other side appears another woman young and marvellously beautiful at first he takes her to be Amenaria, but she is taller blonde as honey very plump with paint upon her cheeks and roses upon her head her long robe weighty with spangles gleams with metallic lustre her fleshy lips are sanguinolent and her somewhat heavy eyelids are so drowned with languor that one would almost take her to be blind she murmurs nay live and joy solomon counsels joy follow the guiding of thy heart and the desire of thine eyes antony what joy is there for me my heart is weary my eyes are dim she answers seek the suburb of rakotis push open a door that is painted blue and when thou shalt be in the atrium where a fountain jet murmurs unceasingly a woman will present herself before thee in peplos of white silk striped with gold her hair is unloosed her laugh like the clatter of cratoli she is skilful in her caress thou wilt taste the pride of initiation and the appeasement of desire hast ever pressed to thy bosom a virgin who loved thee dost remember the surrenders of her modesty the passing away of her remorse in a sweet flow of tears thou canst even now imagine thyself walking with her canst thou not in the wood by the light of the moon at each pressure of your joined hands a sweet shuddering passes through you both looking closely into each other your eyes seem to outpour into one another something like immaterial fluid and thy heart fills it bursts it is a suave whirl of eddying passion an overflowing of intoxication the old woman one need not possess joys in order to taste their bitterness even to view them from afar off begets loathing of them thou must be fatigued by the monotony of the same actions the length of the days the hideousness of the world the stupidity of the sun antony i indeed i loathe all that he shines upon the young woman hermit hermit thou wilt find diamonds among the flints fountains beneath the sand a delectation in all the hazards thou dost despise and there are even upon earth places of such beauty that the sight of them would make thee desire to press the whole world against thy heart with love the old woman each evening that thou liest down upon the earth to slumber thou dost hope that it may soon lie upon thee and cover thee the young woman yet thou dost believe in the resurrection of the flesh which is but the translation of life into eternity even as she speaks the old woman becomes still more fleshless and above her skull from which the white hair has disappeared 
a bat circles in the air. The young woman has become fatter. Her robe gleams with shifting colours. Her nostrils palpitate. Her eyes roll softly. The former opening her arms exclaiming come to me i am consolation repose oblivion eternal calm the other i am the sleep giver life happiness inexhaustible antony turns to flee from them each lays a hand on his shoulder the shroud parts exposes the skeleton of death the robe splits asunder and leaves the whole body of lust exposed her waist is slender her long and undulating hair flutters in the wind antony stands motionless between the two considering them death says to him what matters it whether now or at another time thou art mine like suns nations cities kings mountain snows and the grasses of the fields i fly higher than the hawks of heaven i run more swiftly than the gazelle i overtake even hope i vanquish the son of god lust resist not i am the omnipotent the forests re-echo with my sighs the waters tremble with my agitations virtue courage piety dissolve in the perfume of my mouth man i accompany in every step that he makes and even from the threshold of the tomb he turns to me death i will find for thee that which thou hast vainly sought for by the gleam of torches upon the faces of the dead or among these awful sands that are formed of human remains where thou wast wont to wander beyond the pyramids from time to time the fragment of a skull rolled under thy sandal thou didst take up the dust thou didst let it trickle through thy fingers and thy thought blending with it sank into nothingness lust my gulf is deeper marble have inspired love men rush to conjunctures that terrify fetters are riveted that the fettered curse once the bewitchment of courtesans the extravagance of dreams the immensity of my sadness death mine irony depasseth all others there are convulsions of delight at the funerals of kings at the extermination of a whole people and war is made with music with plumes with harness of gold with vast display of ceremony that my due of homage may be greater lust my rage equals thine i also yell i bite i too have sweats of agony and aspects cadaverous death it is i that make the awful let us intertwine death laughs mockingly lust roars they clasp each other about the waist and chant alternately i hasten the dissolution of matter i facilitate the dispersion of germs thou dost destroy for my renovations thou dost engender for my destructions ever active my power fecund my putrefaction and their voices whose rolling echoes fill the horizon deepen and become so mighty that antony falls backwards as if thunder-stricken a shock from time to time causes him to reopen his eyes and he perceives in the midst of the darkness a manner of monster before him it is a skull crowned with roses dominating the torso of a woman nacreously white below a shroud starred with specks of gold forms something like a tail and the whole body undulates after the fashion of a gigantic worm 
erect on end the vision attenuates disappears antony rising to his feet the devil yet again and under his twofold aspect the spirit of fornication and the spirit of destruction neither affrights me i repel happiness and i know myself to be eternal thus death is only an illusion a veil masking betimes the continuity of life but substance being unique wherefore should forms be varied somewhere there must be primordial figures whose bodily forms are only symbols could i but see them i would know the link between matter and thought i would know in what being consists such were the figures painted at babylon upon the walls of the temple of belus and others like them covered a mosaic in the port of carthage i myself have sometime beheld in the sky as it were forms of spirits those who cross the desert meet with animals surpassing all conception and opposite upon the further side of the nile suddenly appears the sphinx he stretches his paws shakes the bandolets upon his forehead and crouches upon his belly leaping flying spitting fire through her nostrils lashing her winged sides with her dragon tail the green-eyed chimera circles barks the thick curls of her head tossed back upon one side mingle with the hair of her loins on the other side they hang down to the sand quivering with the swinging of her body to and fro the sphinx remaining motionless and gazing at the chimera hither chimera rest a while the chimera no never the sphinx do not run so fast do not fly so high do not bark so loudly the chimera do not call me call me no more since thou must remain for ever dumb the sphinx cease casting thy flames in my face and uttering thy yells in my ear thou canst not melt my granite the chimera thou shalt not seize me terrible sphinx the sphinx thou art too mad to dwell with me the chimera thou art too heavy to follow me the sphinx yet whither goest thou that thou shouldst run so fast the chimera i gallop in the corridors of the labyrinth i hover above the mountains i graze the waves in my flight i yelp at the bottom of precipices i suspend myself with my mouth from the skirts of clouds i sweep the shores with my dragging tail and the curves of the hills have taken their form from the shape of my shoulders but thee i find perpetually immobile or perhaps making strange designs with thy claws upon the sand the sphinx it is because i keep my secret i dream and calculate the sea returns to its bed the wheat bends back and forth in the wind the caravans pass by the dust flies cities crumble and yet my gaze which naught can deviate remains fixed gazing through all intervening things upon a horizon that none may reach the chimera i am light and joyous i offer to the eyes of men dazzling perspectives with paradise in the clouds above and unspeakable felicity afar off into their souls i pour the eternal madnesses projects of happiness plans for the future dreams of glory and vows of love and all virtuous resolutions i urge men to perilous voyages and great enterprises i have chiselled with my claws the wonders of architecture it was i who suspended the little bells above the tomb of porsena 
and surrounded the keys of atlantis with a wall of orichalcum i seek for new perfumes for vaster flowers for pleasures never felt before if i perceive in any place a man whose mind reposes in wisdom i fall upon him and strangle him the sphinx all those tormented by the desire of god i have devoured in order to climb up to my royal brow the strongest ascend upon the flutings of my bandolets as upon the steps of a stairway then a great lassitude comes upon them and they fall backward antony begins to tremble he is no longer before his cabin but in the desert itself with those two monsters beside him whose breath is hot upon his shoulders the sphinx o oh, thou fantasy bear me away upon thy wings that my sadness may be lightened the chimera o oh, thou unknown i am enamoured of thine eyes like a hyena in heat i turn about thee soliciting those fecundations whereof the desires devour me ope thy mouth lift thy feet mount upon my back the sphinx my feet since they have been outstretched can move no more the lichen like an eruption has formed upon my jaws by dint of long dreaming i have no longer aught to say the chimera thou liest hypocrite sphinx wherefore dost thou always call me and always disown me the sphinx it is thou indomitable caprice that dost for ever pass and repass whirling in thy course the chimera is the fault mine what let me be she barks the sphinx thou movest away thou dost escape me he growls the chimera essay thou crushest me the sphinx nay <laughs> impossible and gradually sinking down he disappears in the sand while the chimera ramping with tongue protruding departs describing circles on her way the breath of her mouth has produced a fog through this mist antony perceives wreathing as of clouds undecided curves at last he can distinguish something like the appearance of human bodies end of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of *The Temptation of Saint Anthony* by Gustav Flaubert, translated by Lafcadio Hearn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. And first, the astomai approach, like bubbles of air traversed by sunlight. They cry do not breathe too hard the drops of rain bruise us false notes excoriate us darkness has blind us composed wholly of breezes and of perfumes we float along we roll along a little more than dreams yet not quite beings the nisnas have only one eye one cheek one hand one leg half a body half a heart they say we live quiet in our halves of houses with our halves of wives and our halves of children the blemiers who have no head at all our shoulders are all the broader and there is no ox rhinoceros or elephant able to carry what we carry something dimly resembling features as it were a vague face imprinted upon our breasts that is all we think digestions we subtilize secretions god in our belief floats peacefully within the interior chiles we go straight upon our way 
through all mires, crossing all morasses, skirting the edges of all abysses, and we are the most laborious, the most happy, the most virtuous of all peoples, the pygmies. We, good little men, swarm upon the world like vermin, upon the hump of a dromedary. We are burned, drowned, crushed, and we always reappear, more vivacious and countless than before, terrible by reason of our numbers. The sheopods, fettered to the earth by our hair, long as the honours, we vegetate beneath the shelter of our feet, broad as parasols, and the light comes to us through the thickness of our heels. No annoyances for us, no work. The head as low as possible, or oh, that is the secret of happiness. Their lifted thighs, resembling the trunks of trees, multiply, and a forest appears. Great apes clamber through it on all fours. These are men with the heads of dogs the cynocephali we leap from branch to branch in search of eggs to suck and we pluck the little fledglings alive then we put their nests upon our heads in lieu of caps we tear off the teats of cows and we put out the eyes of lynxes we let fall our dung from the heights of the trees we parade our turpitude in the full light of the sun lacerating the flowers crushing the fruits, befouling the springs, violating women. We are the masters of all by the strength of our arms and the ferocity of our hearts. Ho, oh, companions, gnash with your jaws. Blood and milk pour down their chops. The rain streams over their hairy backs. Antony inhales the freshness of the green leaves. There is a movement among them, a clashing of branches, and all of a sudden appears a huge black stag with the head of a bull, having between his ears a thicket of white horns. The Saduzag. My seventy-four antlers a hollow like flutes when i turn me toward the wind of the south there issue from them sounds that draw all the ravished animals around me the serpents twine about my legs the wasps cluster in my nostrils and the parrots the doves the ibises alight upon the branches of my horns listen he throws back his horns whence issues a music of sweetness ineffable Antony presses both hands upon his heart. It seems to him as though his soul were being borne away by the melody. The Sadhu's sag. But when I turn me toward the wind of the north, my antlers, more thickly bristling than a battalion of lances, give forth a sound of howlings. The forests are startled with fear. The rivers remount toward their sources. The husks of fruit burst open and the bending grasses stand erect on end like the hair of a coward listen he bends his branching antlers forward hideous and discordant cries proceed from them antony feels as though his heart were torn asunder and his horror augments upon beholding the martichoras a gigantic red lion with human face and three rows of teeth. The gleam of my scarlet hair mingles with the reflection of the great sands. I breathe through my nostrils the terror of solitudes. I spit for plague. I devour armies when they venture into the desert. My claws are twisted like screws. My teeth shaped like saws and my curving tail bristles with darts which i cast to right and left before and behind see 
see the marty caress shoots forth the keen bristles of his tail which irradiate in all directions like a volley of arrows drops of blood rain down spattering upon the foliage the catoble pass a black buffalo with a pig's head falling to the ground and attached to his shoulders by a neck long thin and flaccid as an empty gut he wallows flat upon the ground and his feet entirely disappear beneath the enormous mane of coarse hair which covers his face fat melancholy fierce thus i continually remain feeling against my belly the warmth of the mud so heavy is my skull that it is impossible for me to lift it i roll it slowly all around me open-mouthed and with my tongue i tear up the venomous plants bedewed with my breath once i even devoured my own feet without knowing it no one antony has ever beheld mine eyes or at least those who have beheld them are dead were i to lift my eyelids my pink and swollen eyelids thou wouldst forthwith die antony oh that one ugh, as though i could desire it yet his stupidity fascinates me no no i will not he gazes fixedly upon the ground but the weeds take fire and amidst the contortions of the flames arises the basilisk a great violet serpent with trilobate crest and two fangs one above one below beware lest thou fall into my jaws i drink fire i am fire and i inhale it from all things from clouds from flints from dead trees the fur of animals the surface of marshes my temperature maintains the volcanoes i lend glitter to jewels i give colours to metals the griffin a lion with a vulture's beak and white wings red paws and blue neck i am the master of deep splendours i know the secrets of the tombs wherein the kings of old do slumber a chain issuing from the wall maintains their heads upright near them in basins of porphyry the women they loved float upon the surfaces of black liquids their treasures are all arrayed in halls in lozenge-shaped designs in little heaps in pyramids and down below far below the tombs and to be reached only after long travelling through stifling darkness there are rivers of gold bordered by forests of diamonds there are fields of carbuncles and lakes of mercury adust against the subterranean gate i remain with claws uplifted and my flaming eyes spy out those who seek to approach the vast and naked flame that stretches away to the end of the horizon is whitened with the bones of travellers but for thee the gates of bronze shall open and thou shalt inhale the vapour of the mines thou shalt descend into the caverns quick quick he burrows into the earth with his paws and crows like a cock a thousand voices answer him the forest trembles and all manner of frightful creatures arise the tragalaphus half deer half ox the mamecoles lion before and ant behind whose genitals are set reversely the python ascar sixty cubits long that terrified moses 
the huge weasel pastinaca that kills the trees with her odour the prasteros that makes those who touch it imbecile the mirag a horned hare that dwells in the islands of the sea the leopard falmant bursts his belly by roaring the triple-headed bear senad tears her young by licking them with her tongue the dog sepus pours out the blue milk of her teats upon the rocks mosquitoes begin to hum toads commence to leap serpents hiss lightnings flicker hail falls then come gusts bearing with them marvellous anatomies heads of alligators with hooves of deer owls with serpent tails swine with tiger muzzles goats with the crupper of an ass frogs hairy as bears chameleons huge as hippopotami calves with two heads one bellowing the other weeping winged bellies flitting hither and thither like gnats they rain from the sky they rise from the earth they pour from the rocks everywhere eyes flame mouths roar breasts bulge claws are extended teeth gnash flesh clucks against flesh some crouch some devour each other at a mouthful suffocating under their own numbers multiplying by their own contact they climb over one another and move about antony with a surging motion as though the ground were the deck of a ship he feels the trail of snails upon the calves of his legs the chilliness of vipers upon his hands and spiders spinning about him enclose him within their network but the monstrous circle breaks parts the sky suddenly becomes blue and the unicorn appears gallop gallop i have hooves of ivory teeth of steel my head is the colour of purple my body the colour of snow and the horn of my forehead is bestreaked with the tints of the rainbow i travel from chaldea to the tartar desert upon the shores of the ganges and in mesopotamia i overtake the ostriches i run so swiftly that i draw the wind after me i rub my back against the palm trees i roll among the bamboos i leap rivers with a single bound doves fly above me only a virgin can bridle me gallop gallop antony watches him depart and as he gazes he beholds all the birds that nourish themselves with wind the guit the ahutai the alphalim the eucrat of the mountains of kaf the homai of the arabs which are the souls of murdered men he hears the parrots that utter human speech and the great pelagian palmipeds that sob like children or chuckle like old women a saline air strikes his nostrils now a vast beach stretches before him in the distance jets of water arise spouted by whales and from the very end of the horizon come the beasts of the sea round as wineskins flat as blades denticulated like saws dragging themselves over the sand as they approach thou wilt accompany us to our immensities whither as yet no one has descended diverse peoples inhabit the countries of the ocean some dwell in the sojourn of tempests others swim freely amid the transparency of chill waves or like oxen graze upon the coral plains or suck in through their trunks the reflux of the tides or bear upon their shoulders 
the vast weight of the sources of the sea phosphorescences gleam in the moustaches of the seals shift in the scales of fish echini whirl like wheels ammonites uncoil like cables oysters make their shell hinges squeak polypi unfold their tentacles medusae quiver like balls of crystal suspended sponges float hither and thither anemones ejaculate water rack and sea mosses have grown all about and all sorts of plants extend themselves into branches twist themselves into screws lengthen into points round themselves out like fans girds take the appearance of breasts lianas interlace like serpents the dedaims of babylon which are trees bear human heads for fruit mandragoras sing the root paaras runs through the grass and now the vegetables are no longer distinguishable from the animals polyparies that seem like trees have arms upon their branches antony thinks he sees a caterpillar between two leaves it is a butterfly that takes flight he is about to step on a pebble. A grey locust leaps away. One shrub is bedecked with insects that look like petals of roses. Fragments of ephemerides form a snowy layer upon the soil. And then the plants become confounded with the stones. Flints assume the likeness of brains, stalactites of breasts, the flower of iron resembles a figured tapestry he sees efflorescences in fragments of ice imprints of shrubs and shells yet so that one cannot detect whether they be imprints only or the things themselves diamonds gleam like eyes metals palpitate and all fear has departed from him he throws himself down upon the ground and leaning upon his elbows watches breathlessly insects that have no stomachs persistently eat withered ferns bloom again and reflower absent members grow again at last he perceives tiny globular masses no larger than pinheads with cilia all around them they are agitated with a vibratile motion antony deliriously oh joy oh bliss i have beheld the birth of life i have seen the beginning of motion my pulses throb even to the point of bursting i long to fly to swim to bark to bellow to howl would that i had wings a carapace a shell that i could breathe out smoke wield a trunk make my body writhe divide myself everywhere be in everything emanate with odours develop myself like the plants flow like water vibrate like sound shine like light squatting upon all forms penetrate each atom descend to the very bottom of matter be matter itself day at last appears and like tabernacle curtains uplifted clouds of gold uprolling in broad volutes unveil the sky even in the midst thereof and in the very disk of the sun beams the face of jesus christ antony makes the sign of the cross and resumes his devotions. Fini. End of chapter 14 End of the Temptation of St. Anthony by Gustav Flaubert Translated by Lacadio Hearn